Do not stand at my grave and weep. Anonymous. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glint of snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle morning rain. And when you wake in morning's hush, I am the sweet uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. Quilt by John Updike. The quilt that covers us all to date has patches numbered one to 48. Five northern rents, a crooked central seam, a ragged eastern edge, a way of bunching ugly and a perhaps too energetic color scheme. Though shaken every 25 years, this fine old quilt was beaten on the line. It took long making, generations pass. While thread was sought and calico, and silk were coaxed from Mexico and France, the biggest squares were added last. Don't kick your cover, son. The bed is built, so you can never shake the clinging quilt that blanketed your birth and tries to keep your waking warm and palpable as atmosphere, as earth is shall be tucked about you through your longest sleep. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we I hear America singing, the buried carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his, as it should be, blithe and strong, the carpenter singing his, as he measures his plank or beam, the mason singing his, as he makes ready for work or leaves off work, the boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat, the deckhand singing on the steamboat deck, the shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench, the hatter singing as he stands, the woodcutter's song, the plowboy's, on his way in the morning, or at the noon intermission, or at sundown, the delicious singing of the mother, or of the young wife at work, or of the girl sewing or washing, each singing what belongs to her and to none else, the day what belongs to the day. At night, the party of young fellows, robust, friendly, singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. Vigils from the Methods of Nonviolent Protest and Persuasion by Jean Sharp. A vigil is an appeal normally addressed not to one or a few persons, but to many people. Like picketing, a vigil consists of people remaining at a particular place as means of expressing a point of view. It differs from picketing, however, in that it is frequently maintained over a long period of time, sometimes around the clock, and it is associated with a more solemn attitude, often of a pleading or religious character. It often involves late hours and loss of sleep. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by faceless cowards, and freedom will be defended. 
I want to reassure the American people that the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my Cabinet. We have taken all appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status. We've taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. Make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. Oh, beautiful, far spacious skies for amber waves of rain, for purple mountain majesty. from the Dhammapada, translated by Thomas Byram. All beings tremble before violence. All fear death, all love life. See yourself in others, then whom can you hurt? What harm can you do? He who seeks happiness by hurting those who seek happiness will never find happiness. For your brother is like you. He wants to be happy. Never harm him. And when you leave this life, you too will find happiness. Victims Fight Back by Jody Wilgren and Edward Wong, September 13th, 2001. They told the people they loved that they would die fighting. In a series of cellular telephone calls to their wives, two passengers aboard the plane that crashed into a Pennsylvania airfield instead of possibly toppling a national landmark, learned about the horror of the World Trade Center. From 35,000 feet, they relayed harrowing details about the hijacking in progress to the police. And they vowed to try to thwart the enemy, to prevent others from dying even if they could not save themselves. The accounts revealed a spirit of defiance amid the desperation. Relatives and friends and a congressman who represented the area around the crash site in Pennsylvania hailed the fallen passengers as the patriots of America's darkest day. Apparently, they made enough of a difference that the plane did not complete its mission, said Tom Crowley, uncle of Lisbeth Glick, passenger Jeremy Glick's widow. In an email message forwarded far and wide, Mr. Crowley urged, May we remember Jeremy and the other brave souls and heroes, soldiers and Americans on United Fight 93, who so gallantly gave their lives to save many others.
Peace from If We Listen Well by Edward Guinan. Conflict will always be an integral part of human life, but our methods of dealing with it need to change. We must be willing to develop an ongoing critical view of our values, operating premises, and relationships, and sensitivity to those about us. Peace demands that one anticipate the effects of his views and actions on others, and the unifying or destructive effects they may have. Most importantly, one comes to realize that the end does not justify the means. We get what we do, not what we hope for or intend. You cannot improve a man through punishment, nor can you bring peace through war or brotherhood through brutalization. What kind of peace do I mean? What kind of peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war? Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave? I am talking about genuine peace. The kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living. The kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace for all time. I speak of peace, therefore, as the necessary rational end of rational men. I realize that the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war, and frequently the words of the pursuer fall on deaf ears. But we have no more urgent task. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. We'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. It's hard to believe that the senior class this year wasn't born when September 11th occurred. Tonight it has been 19 years since that day. It is our goal this evening to remember and to honor. We praise peace and love and life and are deeply grateful to be surrounded by a community that shares that sentiment. Thank you for your time and your continued company along this path towards a brighter tomorrow. The Wissick and Camarada wishes peace to you and your families.